Greetings to all my tech heads out there in the Kev Techify Nation. And if you're new here, welcome. In this episode, we're going to look at routing protocol authentication. We'll be discussing dynamic routing protocols, route, routing protocol spoofing, OSPF MD5 protocol authentication, OSPF SHA routing protocol authentication. And then we're going to look at basic device configuration and OSPF authentication. And finally, we're going to actually configure OSPF authentication. This episode is part of my series on network security. I'm Kevin here at Kev Techify. Let's get this adventure started. Dynamic routing protocols perform several activities, including network discovery and maintaining routing tables. Important advantages here of dynamic routing protocols are the ability to select the best path and the ability to automatically discover a new best path when there's a change in the topology. You as the administrator, you don't have to go in and enter st static routes. You let the protocol take care of the calculations of what's the best best path and it will do the calculation in real time so if a if a connection goes down in the middle of the night you're not woken up by alarms or people calling you saying the network's down the routing protocol will automatically adjust for you a dynamic routing protocol allows the routers to automatically learn about these networks from other routers here we have a diagram. We have R1 and R2. They're using a common routing protocol. It doesn't really matter what routing protocol at this point in time. We're just looking at the general idea and they're going to share information. Now, when you set up a routing protocol, what you do is you enter all the directly connected networks. You enter all the directly connected IP version four addresses. And if you're using IP version six addresses, you enter all the directly connected IP version six networks. So on router one here, on router one, we have the 10.0.1, the 10.0.1.0 network. And we also have the IP version six address, 2001 DB8 ACAD colon one. And this is the important one. We also have another directly connected network, IP version 4, 10.0.2.0. So the third octet is different than the one above. And we also have this network address for IP version 6, 2001DB8ACAD2. Notice the 2 and the 1, they're different. But there's a third network. We can't forget about the third network. The third network is the one shared between R1 and R2. That is directly connected there. So we have the 10.0.3.0 network there. And then we have the 2001 DB8 ACAD. And then we have the three there. Those are the three directly connected networks. What R1 does is I'm going to share with R2 all the networks I know about. So it knows about three different networks. It knows about this network, network one, network two, and then network three here in the middle. R2 is going to get that in and it's going to say, okay, that those are your networks. I know of three different networks also. I know of network three here in the middle. I know of network four up here, which is 10.0.4. We also have the IP version six on this same network. Notice, notice once again, the change in the address. And I also know about five. So it's going to look at these networks. It's going to share. So router one shared one, two, and three. Router two is going to share with R1, three, four, and five. The routing protocol recognizes that three is a shared network. So that's the network that connects them. But router one doesn't, four, five, and four and five is not directly connected to R1. So that's a remotely connected network. We've learned that through our routing protocol. Same thing over here with R2. R2 has three, four, and five directly connected. And so R1 sent over router or networks one, two, and three. Three was the commonly shared one, but it didn't know about two and one. Those are remote ones, remote networks. R2 Networks one and two are remote networks they learned about through the routing protocol. 
Routing systems can be attacked by disrupting peer network routers or by falsifying or spoofing the information that is carried within those routing protocols. Spoofing or routing information may generally be used to cause systems misinformation, basically have the routers lie to each other, cause maybe a denial of service attack, or cause traffic to follow a path it wouldn't normally follow. So it would go to a router that maybe is not connected to the destination. Now, there are several consequences of routing information being spoofed. The first one here is redirecting traffic to create routing loops. Because the routing protocol is supposed to pick out the best path through the network, but if you get your information spoofed, it could actually create a circle and then your, your information would travel in a circle until that time to live got down to zero. Another consequence is, is redirecting traffic so it can be monitored on an insecure link. A threat actor could come in, redirect traffic to a port they can control. Now they could start monitoring traffic, maybe looking for something that is being sent in clear text using Wireshark. And then finally, you can redirect traffic just to get rid of it. All of a sudden your data is just disappearing on your network. All of these can be, all of these things can be done with routing protocol spoofing. To enable OSPF MD5 authentication globally, you have to use a couple of commands. First command you have to use is the IP OSPF message digest key, and then you have to specify what the key is, and then you have to specify what the MD5 password is. Second thing you have to do is specify the, the area and give it the area ID for your OSPF, then authentication, and then what your message digest is. What this does is this method, this method, this method forces authentication on all OSPF enabled interfaces. Now, if an interface is not con configured with the IP OSPF message digest key command, if it doesn't have that, it will not be able to perform adjacencies with other OSPF neighbors. If you like this episode on routing pr protocol authentication and you get value out of it, and depending upon the platform you're using, please click that like button, give a five-star rating, leave a comment. Doing this supports the channel, which in turn helps me bring you more great content. Click that notification bell to turn on notifications to be alerted every time I release a new episode and there are a bunch more episodes headed your way. You can also visit my website at kevtechify.com for all my details and how to get these episodes in video and podcast form. Now, to enable that uh, MD5 authentication on a per interface basis, we have to get into our global configuration mode, config T. You have to go into the interface. So right here, we're gonna go into serial 000. Once we're in there, we, and once we're in our interface configuration, enter an IP OSPF message digest key. And so this was the key here. And then we enter in our password. Then what we do is we enter in our ISPF authentication message digest right here. What this does is it sets up our authentication for our router. Now we did this on R1. So we did this on R1. R1 is connected to R2 through our serial interfaces. Because we only set it up on one side, notice that we had an adjacency change right here on serial zero. We went from a full adjacency to down. Neighbor down, dead timer expired because they're not authenticated to talk with each other. They're not authenticated to talk with each other. That that OSPF adjacency went down. What we can do then is go over to R2, go into our config T, and as you can see, our adjacency changed, our neighbor went down, dead timer expired. So let's go into our serial connection that connects back to R1, which is interface serial zero, zero, zero. Do the same commands we did. So IP OSPF message digest key. So the key matches, the password matches. Then we do IP OSPF authentication message digest that 
finishes our configuration. Press enter and then notice we now have another adjacency change. We went from loading, which is part of the OSPF process, to now we have a full adjacency. Both sides have that MD, MD5 authentication set up, so now it can communicate with each other. If somebody else would try to enter into the system and disconnect that serial cable into theirs, they would have to have that security set up, that MD5 authentication on their connection to get it to work. MD5 is now considered vulnerable to attacks. It should only be used when stronger authentication is not available. Administrators should use the SHA authentication as long as all of the router operating systems support OSPF SHA authentication. You have to do two steps. This, this box right here is step one. For step one, you have to specify an authentication keychain in the global configuration mode. So what we do here is we configure a keychain name right here. So keychain, and then what do we want to call it? So we specify a name. Then we assign the keychain a number. So we assign it the number and password with the key in the key string here. So the key string then sets up our password. So this is our password here. Once we have those commands set, then we specify SHA authentication. Right here, we use the cryptographic algorithm, and then we specify one of our SHA methods. Now, once again, MD5 is considered not secure. And finally, for step one, we can specify the send lifetime start time. Now, this, this will specify when this key will expire with, with the command. And as you can see here, we can have it set to infinite, end time or we can set it in a duration of seconds how long this key is good for this send lifetime that line is optional step two here is the second box so this is step two what we have to do is we have to assign the authentication key to the desired interfaces so what we go here is we go into our interface once we're into our interface, we are, once again, notice we're in the interface configuration mode. Then we issue the IP OSPF authentication keychain, and then that is the name we specified up here. Here's an example of SHA authentication between R1 and R2. We have our R1 and R2. We have our serial connections that are connected to each other. We have OSPF configured. Now we want to make sure that we set up authentication on those interfaces. We're going to start this example here working on R1. Right here we are on R1. What we're going to do is we're going to configure our, our keychain with the name of SHA-256. So this is the name of our keychain. Key then we're gonna assign that key number. So we assign it number one. We're gonna set the password for this key as OSPF SHA-256. Then we're gonna specify what SHA authentication here by using the cryptographic dash algorithm. And then this is the algorithm we are using. We're using the HMAC SHA-256 algorithm to authenticate our traffic. Go ahead and type exit, exit. So we've set up our keychain. That's what these first couple steps are is we set up our keychain and our encryption. Then we go into the interface. Once again, we go into the interface. Here, this is a type, this is serial. And then we actually have the number of that. So we're going to serial 000. Once we're in there, we then specify IP OSPF, we want to set the authentication. We want to set it to this keychain, and this is the name we gave it from right here. So this is the same name that we set it up with. Once we set that up, we set up in or authentication right here. Notice that we had an adjacency change. We went from full to down. Our neighbor is down with a dead timer. Once again, we have authentication set up on one side, but not the other side. To fix this, we then go back over to R2 and basically we repeat, repeat the same process. We enter in our keychain, we give it a name of 256. 
Now, this name is local to the machine, so you can name it something different. You don't have to name it what you named it on R1, but seeing as this is just the SHA-256, keep things simple, let's name it the same. Then we give it the ID, we set the password here for our key, and now we set the algorithm here using the cryptographic algorithm. We're using the HMAX SHA-256. Now, this part, what algorithm you're using, that has to match. If they don't match, they won't be able to talk with each other. Exit out, exit out. We go back into our serial 000 interface. That's what's connected to R1. We set, we do IP OSPF. We want to set our L or sorry, our authentication to what keychain? This is the name of the keychain we set up right there. We set it up. We get an adjacency change, and now notice we are going to full. We are have full adjacency between those now that we have the same authentication set up on both sides. It was my pleasure to provide you with this wonderful episode on routing protocol authentication. If you like this episode and you got value out of it, and depending upon the platform you are using, please click that like button, give a five-star rating, leave a comment. This all helps me bring you more great content. Please take a minute to subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell. All my socials and contact information are on my website, kevtechify.com. You can get all of these episodes in video and podcast form. In the upper right is my playlist for my series on network security. In the bottom right is one of my favorite videos I picked just for you. Thank you so much for watching this episode on my series on network security. Once again, I'm Kevin. This is Kev Techify. I'll see you next time for another great adventure.